living that consciousness of love that I celebrate our beloved pastor, Reverend John Scott, who on a third Sunday gives us a message, homework. Why? The, mm, for the homework, that means Rev that don't do any homework from first Sunday. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to read out to anybody this morning. I'm just going to call our beloved Reverend John to the podium for a wonderful message this morning. Reverend John. Good morning, worldwide spiritual family. I'm not going to do the, work, the, the homework I'm give you. <laughs> encouragement. Well, I have an encouragement for you this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone in the sanctuary and out on the World Wide Web to the beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. As Reverend Ann said earlier, the, the Poncianas are aflame and our hearts are also on fire with love with joy, and with the, just the beauty of being able to come together as we just sang in perfect harmony, one with the spirit in perfect harmony. I want to talk this morning about consciousness. You know, the illumined consciousness of Dr. Elmer Lumsden and our founding members gave rise to this center, now known as Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, but lovingly called by all of us, the temple. You're going to Temple Sunday? Where are you? I've just come in from Temple. Why well, we have a rehearsal with Angela at Temple. We talk about the, the temple or temple all the time, don't we? And then sometimes we think about the temple of the living God, which is our body temple, in which the spirit of love and laughter and joy and life itself is also enshrined in perpetual splendor. So this church was founded on and built by consciousness, my friends. And it must be maintained and sustained by our collective consciousness, our collective understanding of why we are here and what we are here to do. What are we about, really? And so my encouragement this morning is titled Consciousness the cornerstone of our temple. And it is a call to everyone who worships, works, serves, studies, or even just visit periodically to be a doorkeeper of your consciousness. Because it is the cornerstone of your life. And everything in your experience and in the collective experience of those of us who share this belief and this teaching, and who have come together as we do Sunday after Sunday and year after year for the past 40 years in a confluence of faith and deep belief and love and with the intention that this life-transforming teaching should spread to the four corners of the earth. No? Yes. We see this as the answer to the world's challenges and to the, the hearts that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you know, my friends, Dr. Elmer named us Temple of Light. I think about it all the time. What an inspiration to have called us a Temple of Light. Because we are called upon to be a lantern, a light to those who are in darkness, we're called upon to be a place of refuge for those feeling perhaps weary or afraid or uncertain. We are a place, my friends, of fellowship, a place of instruction and learning, a place where the truth sets men and women free from the bondage of fear and the feelings of separation from the source into that wonderful expression of freedom which honors the presence of the divine in every single sentient being, in every blade of grass, in every rock, in every tree, in every blossom, and most of all, in our brothers and sisters all across the face of 
this planet Earth, this beautiful planet. So at the same time as being a place of learning, we want our temple to be a place of buzzing activity, formed by divine ideas which, when put into action, bring growth in spiritual vision, growth in numbers of the people whom we touch, and in finances, and thus in services rendered to our society and to the entire world. This is our divine dharma. And so it is vitally important that all of us who attend the temple, either in person or online, build a consciousness which reflects the zest and vitality of spirit. And it is important that we be open and receptive to growth and to change and to enjoy being of service to our fellow human beings. Every one of you, my friends, is God's trustee, charged with the responsibility of knowing the truth, not just for yourself, but for the world, and charged with teaching this truth through your example to others. We are indeed called to be a light in the darkness, and as Reverend Anne Shand, our assistant minister, so aptly put it in her message a few Sundays ago, we are called to be salt for seasoning one another. And she made the point that it only takes a pinch of salt to alter the, the taste of the stew, don't? You don't have to put, in fact, you shouldn't put too much. Just a few grains of the correct seasoning can lift a meal. So arising out of our summit 2020, six amazing innovative teams of dedicated volunteers coordinated by Ms. Lorna Phillips, whom I call the divine organizer, <laughs> have for the past nine months visioned, prayed, worked, planned, and I have no doubt also argued together as they cast a vision for the Temple of Light going forward. The vision of change they cast is exciting and is inspiring, to say the least. And they will present it as a strategy outline this morning in our extraordinary general meeting. And uh, you know, as I noted, they have spent nine months working nonstop, intensively, to produce this, what we are going to witness this morning. And so I want to invite you to invest the one and a half or two hours of your time to share with us and to support this bold vision of the future of our beloved Temple of Light. I see everyone who attends this center as a radiating beacon of truth. Each of us is a temple of light, a temple of the living God where the flame that is eternal and can never be extinguished burns on the altar of our lives. and illumines not just our own consciousness, but the consciousness of all humankind. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' words reach across the centuries to challenge each of us this morning to accept the responsibility of bringing spiritual leaven to the truth in our world to be that pinch of salt which is needed so that all may taste and see how beautiful it is to live in close contact with the indwelling God. In that same wonderful sermon, the master teacher says in Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, and I quote, ye are the light of the world. I wonder if Reverend Emma was reading that when she named us Temple of Light. Jesus said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all who are in the house. This is a very interesting um, picture Jesus paints, because in, in, the, in, the, in the houses at the time of Jesus, there were big square rooms, and you had families living in each corner. 
And so sometimes if neighbors fell out uh, and one neighbor didn't have enough, enough fuel for their lamp, the other neighbor's lights would light there, would allow them, give them light to see. But if there was any grudgefulness or, um, you know, as we say in Jamaica, nenge, nenge, between them, then the one with the light would put a, a shade over it so that only the people in their corner could experience the light. And Jesus is saying, don't put your light under a shade. Let it shine so that all in the house and houses in the Bible always mean consciousness. So that all with the consciousness of truth, of beauty, of love, and of joy can see in the light that burns in the temple of your life and glorify the Father, the Mother, the Creator of all humankind. My friends, light is a very interesting electromagnetic phenomenon, you know, that we, we really don't understand much of it, although we have learned how to use it. When you consider that light waves travel the 93 million miles from the sun to Earth in just seven minutes, you begin to wonder, eh? wow, isn't, isn't God amazing? And isn't, isn't, isn't the whole idea, the mystery of light just, you know, you can, you can shine light, light, light. You can't make darkness, but you can make light. And you do it by simply setting your intention to let, as Jesus said, your light so shine that others may see and seek to do what? Glorify the Father in heaven and seek to find the light within themselves. In the same sense, we cannot really fathom the infinite God potential in our fellow humans, can we? We call it the light that lighteth every man coming into the world. But friends, people visiting the temple for the first time have told me that they could sense and even see that light and love in the people here. And it is what made them decide to make this their spiritual home and to come again and again to experience the love and the laughter and the joy and the illumination of living in close contact with the creator of all life. So it's not surprising because within the very nature of every human being, there is stored up divine energy. Like a piece of coal, you know, if, when you think of a piece of coal, it is, it is stored up energy from millions of years, perhaps. And it can be returned to energy through the process of combustion. But again, it's still a mystery that this light can come forth whenever we decide to ignite it, to light the candle of the Lord that is within each and every human being, and to say, I will let my light shine so that all may see and glorify the Father. Can we say that together? I will let my light shine. Together. I will, I will let my light shine so all may see and glorify the Father. So all may see and glorify the Father. And you know the wonderful thing, my friends? In the same way that one doesn't hide the candle under a shade or a bushel, you cannot hide your spirituality. You, can, you cannot cover it for too long. There is something within you that wants to come out and to express your godness and your goodness. So you don't have to announce it that you have found the truth. You simply have to let your light shine. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American essayist, philosopher, and poet who led the transcendentalist movement in the mid-19th century, said that what you say Speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. What you are, how you are being, speak so loudly that I can't hear what you're trying to say. And so this brings me to your assignment. Your assignment this week has to do with attitudes of being. And I want to take you back to Matthew. 
I want you to read Matthew chapter, seven, chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. And if you are adventurous, read Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7. The two chapters. It is the Sermon on the Mount, and it is just such a stirring, uh, inspiring, and beautiful treatise on consciousness. And as you read, I want you to reflect on this, on the words, and on anything in the Master's admonition that touches your heart. Reflect on which attitudes of being you need to work on in order to uplevel your consciousness and to let your light shine. You see, when you read something that you really resonate with, you know, something that you find inspiring and unforgettable, it is because the words have stirred up an awareness and a depth of spirituality within you. It is this releasement of your innate potential that is the object of any study that you undertake and any job that you set out to do. The words of a teacher, the words in a book, or the words in a course of study, even the words of the Bible, my friends, are not the object of your search, but the means to an end. The whole purpose of coming to church, of being in communion and community, of coming to classes and learning more of the truths of life that set free, of reading the Bible, it's not just that of itself. It is a means to your upleveling your consciousness, strengthening your faith, and deepening your connection with the indwelling presence and power that always is right at hand awaiting your call upon it. So for some, you know, belonging to, some treat religion as like a, a takeout service, you know, a delicatessen where you pick up prayer and faith sometime when you feel hungry. But that is not the purpose. The purpose is a deepening of your faith and of your relationship with God. The word religion means to bind together. It is a relationship and awareness of our unity with the creative force we call God. The church, therefore, has a vital place in our lives, and we need to do all that we can to ensure that it, it thrives, it grows, and it does what we say we want it to do. We have stopped calling it a church, and instead we, we call ourselves a center. And I love that image, you know, the center of a wheel with spokes that radiate out. Um, and it's just a wonderful thought that we can be a center of learning, a center of love, a center of refuge where people who feel lonely and abandoned or uh, just have lost their sense of touch with spirit can come and to re-energize and revitalize th their spiritual energies. And so it's a center, my friends, that is God-led, God-inspired, and grounded. It is the cornerstone is the consciousness, not just of our founding members, God bless them, but the cornerstone of the consciousness of each and every one of us that come here to praise God, to learn more about who we are, and to deepen our faith, spread our love, and find the inspiration and the strength to do the work that we have been called to do. I want to end with a, a story about consciousness, which underscores the importance of being mindful about our states or attitudes of beingness, as you will read in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And this story is titled, Go, Go, and Come, Come. And it is from the parables of Swami Rama Tirtha, an Indian Swami. And the parable is about two brothers involved in litigation. The brothers come before a magistrate and the magistrate is puzzled because one brother is a millionaire and the other brother is a pauper. 
And so the magistrate inquires of the rich brother how it is that he was so wealthy while his brother was so poor. He said, the richer brother said, five years ago, we inherited equal property from our parents. $50,000 fell to his share and $50,000 to me. This man, my brother, regarded himself as wealthy and became lazy. Whatever work was to be done, he would say to his, his servants and his workers, go, go, look after this matter. He lulled away his time in ease and comfort, and his philosophy was, eat, drink, and be merry. The rich brother continued, when I received my $50,000, I never committed my work to anybody. When anything was to be done, I would run to do it myself, and always I told my workers, come, come, follow me. He continues, the words on my lips were always, come, come. And the words from my brother were always, go, go. So everything he possessed obeyed his motto. His workers, his friends, his property, and his wealth went away, entirely left him and he was bereft. My maxim was come friends, come with me. Let us work together so we can prosper. And so my property increased and everything in my life multiplied. That's a lesson in consciousness, isn't it? Are you saying to the good in your life, go, go, because I don't think I'm worthy? Or go, let somebody else do it. Sometimes we need something to be done here at the center, and, we, and you know, people say, oh, yes, that's wonderful. Um, well, I hope so-and-so will do it, or I hope somebody will do it, because it really needs to be done. What about you? And so that, that whole philosophy of go, go is something we need to be careful about. And instead, we need to adopt a mindset and a consciousness of come, come, come with me, come with us. Come, let us do something together that is worthwhile and noble and that will make this a world that works for everyone. Swami Rama points out what we in the science of mind know to be the truth. When we rely on the outer, everything eventually goes. If you put your faith in the outer, in the outside world, everything eventually goes. And I just want to share with you that our uh, consciousness raising quadrant will be putting on a, a workshop, a, a course, which we're calling a prosperity adventure for 12 weeks, beginning on September, give me the date, 15. And it is an adventure because it is an exploration of how we can combine the outer, the inheritance that we get, the goodness that has been given to us by life with the spiritual consciousness of prosperity and therefore move from where we are in consciousness to a consciousness of prosperity that is all embracing. And you know, it's not just about getting, it's about the circulation of God's good in your life. And that is what our whole mission and vision as well going forward to, for the next 40 years is about. It's about how do we take this teaching so that we can say as the master teacher said, and we can say to each other and to the world, come, come, join us in the creation of something so wonderful and so trans life transforming and so beautiful that you will, you will amaze even yourself at the power that is resident within you and that you can call upon this power at any time, in any place, in any circumstance and let God be God in, through, for, and as every aspect of your life.
And so, friends, I say with you, as the Master said, come, come, come with us to create a temple of light which is indeed a center for spiritual living, a blessing to humankind, and a joy to God. Namaste.